Okay, so welcome everybody. It's so great to see everyone here. And um, please do remember to go to the website cancerpreventionandrecovery.org. Um, all of the lessons are there and information about our next class and all of that. So today we're going to be talking about part two of the lecture that we began last month about metabolism. And I called it a deeper understanding of our relationship to food by better understanding metabolism. So I'm just going to review quickly what we learned last month so that we come back into the speed of things. Um, metabolism is just all of the chemical processes that are going on in our bodies. And so um, we talked about how to increase our metabolism. Uh, we know that some people we talk about say have very fast metabolisms and they can eat every anything and everything and they don't gain any weight and some people have a very slow metabolism and so we talked about is metabolis ma metabolism something that is static and it's not it's something that we can change so somebody with a slow metabolism can actually do things to make their metabolism be faster so a couple of the things that we looked at that, uh, that w can help us change our metabolism and make them faster is to breathe deeply. So, you know, meditation, for example, is something that I recommend because it creates that space of time where we can breathe deeply. And one exercise that I started doing about a month ago is um, I will just lie in bed, say that I'm, I, if I wake up early and I have some time before I need to get up or in the middle of the day say after lunch I want to just take a little break then I'll lie down for 10 minutes and I'll set you know a timer so that it's just 10 minutes and I'll just lie there and breathe deeply and just count my breaths and see how far I get and of course the mind tries to wander and you start thinking about something that you have to do later in the day or you're worried about something or you remember that you have to call somebody and then you have to just kind of still your mind again and just breathe, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. And it's really great because it really just helps the body to relax and it gets us to breathe deeply. And that's gonna help our metabolism. Also drinking more water. So breathing is important because oxygen is the most important uh, ingredient in metabolism. And then the second most important is water. And then number three, we talked about not only the types of foods we eat, whether we sh you know, eat more fruits and vegetables, things that are natural, but improving the quality of what we eat. So you know, if we're gonna have um, steak and potatoes, we should try to have the best steak that we can find. And the healthiest potatoes, you know, the freshest, the mm -hmm. most natural, so improving the quality of our food is going to improve. Hi, welcome. It's going to improve the our metabolism and allow it to to be faster, to be more efficient. So every week I have a question, and I want you to just take a moment and discuss it. Does an increase in metabolism equal better health? So we talk about some people having faster metabolisms and other people having slower metabolisms, does that affect health or does that just affect how much we can eat and whether we gain weight or not? So does an increase in metabolism equal better health? And so each table can maybe introduce yourselves to the people sitting there so we get to know each other and then just take a moment to discuss this question. So we'll go ahead and leave that question open <laughs> and see what we think at the end of the session. So is metabolism, does increased metabolism equal better health? So today we're going to look at four uh, specific topics. And one is the body's metabolic cycle. So first we want to understand how our metabolism works from day to day. And there is a specific cycle that it follows. How mood affects food. <laughs> And then I mentioned this last uh, topic, last month, that there is actually something called 
the nutrient assimilation on off switch or we have a system in our bodies that turns on nutrient absorption and then a system that turns off nutrient absorption so we could if we have our nutrient absorption off and we eat the body the food just goes straight through us we don't absorb any of that nutrition so it's I mean we could say it's useless to eat in that case so we're gonna understand that also so that we understand how it's best to eat so that we do absorb the nutrition and then at the end we're going to talk about this idea of calorie counting because here in the United States you know that's kind of what they've taught us to do that our relationship to food needs to be about counting calories and so you know the average person in their 30s that weighs in a certain amount and is so tall should eat 2,000 calories a day and if you eat more than that then you're gonna gain weight if you eat less than that you're gonna lose weight and it's really not that simple that's a very 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 oversimplified explanation on the topic of calories and so I'm going to hopefully uh, teach us a better way to look at food and nutrition and we looked at this a little bit last month but we'll be reviewing it some more so first metabolism metabolism is the collection of all the chemical processes in our body so breathing is part of the metabolism because we're breathing in oxygen there's chemical reactions going on and then we breathe out carbon dioxide when we eat that's part of the process because we're taking in foods they're breaking down and then different chemicals minerals are being absorbed by the body used and then uh, taken out of the body so all of these processes even something as simple as producing the energy to move so for our muscles to move that means that certain chemicals have to interact with other chemicals creates energy and then our muscles can absorb that energy our brain sends chemical signals also to those muscles that teach it tell it to contract so all of these processes are the our metabolism so it's a very very complex thing but eating and the process of taking in food is crucial to all of these processes just like breathing is as well or sleeping there are integral integral processes in having a healthy metabolism so to begin with the general rhythm of metabolism is guided by the Sun and that makes sense but to to put it very basically um, light and temperature which are two things that the Sun affects tremendously on us you know when the Sun is out then it's very light when the Sun is gone it's very dark when the Sun is here it's warm when the Sun is gone it's cold so both light and temperature which the Sun gives us every single day affects our metabolism greatly so at night while we're sleeping our metabolism is at its slowest point and then during the day at midday when the Sun is shining hottest straight above that's when our metabolism is as fast as it is during the day and our metabolism varies every single day it speeds up and then slows down and speeds up and slows down and this is the process that we want to understand because the more we understand it the more we can use that natural process to make wise decisions in the way we manage our body and eat and sleep and all of those things so the simplest way to measure metabolism our metabolic rate is to take our temperature so there is this general myth that our temperature should be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit well that's kind of an average that doctors have made up to make it simple but it's not that simple because our temperature varies throughout the day when we're sleeping our body is colder so if you take a 
temperature, uh, temperature reading of our, your body when you're sleeping, it's actually probably going to be under 98.6 degrees. And when we're very active, if you've just come back from jogging or you know, playing tennis with a friend, your body is going to be hotter than 98.6 degrees. And that's not good or bad. That's just the way our bodies work. So this 98.6 is just kind of an average ballpark that indicates that you're healthy. So our, our body temperature will vary about one degree between the coldest point and the warmest point. So there's not a huge variation, but it does vary quite a lot. And one degree for the body is a tremendous change. One degree is really, really drastic. For example, when we have a fever, what did we say about measuring metabolism? It has to do with temperature. So if our temperature is higher than 98.6, let's say our temperature is 99.6, and we are sick and we feel that we have our fever, it means that our body's metabolism is working extra hard. That our, metabolist, our metabolic rate, met metabolic rate is increased. And why does the body do that? Well, it's working extra hard to defend our body. There's some foreign substance, whether a bacteria or a virus, and our body is working really, really hard to get rid of it, or any other sickness in general. So tied to metabolism is also, and temperature is also our mental state, our awareness. So we feel more awake, more alert, when our body temperature is high, or if it's rising. And we feel more, feel more sleepy when it's decreasing or when it's low. So if you're sitting there and you're feeling sleepy and you know, your eyes start to blink, well, your body temperature is going down because the air conditioning is on, because you're sitting still, you know, your body is just naturally relaxing. So your, your met metabolic rate is decreasing, your temperature is lowering. And so you're going to feel a little sleepy. And that's perfectly natural and normal. So now I'm going to walk us through a normal day and how our metabolism changes. So this, you know, of course, we all have different days. But I'm kind of using uh, the sun as our guide. So let's say we sleep from midnight to 6 a.m. Why did I say that we wake up at 6 a.m.? Because that's when the sun comes up. And it will vary from summer to winter. So, you know, it could be 7. But for, for this, let's say 6, 6 a.m. So you wake up at 6 a.m., the sun has gone up. If you were to take your temperature, you know, it would probably be 97.9, say. And so that's a pretty low temperature, your, metabolis, your metabolism is running low. It doesn't mean that your body isn't active. You're still breathing, your heart is pumping, your brain is doing stuff, your you know, blood is taking things from cells and taking energy to the cells and bringing trash back to the liver to get rid of. So your body is active, it's just the metabolic rate is low. And then from 6 to 7, you're starting to wake up. You get out of bed, you maybe go brush your teeth, you take a shower, you choose what you're going to wear for that day, you maybe pre prepare yourself a little breakfast, but you're not really fully going. You're kind of getting ready. You're packing your bag for work or whatever things you need to do, answering a quick email, sending a message to a friend, whatever. So during that hour, you're temperature is rising, your body is begin beginning to get going, and our metabolism is rising. So then from 7 to 11, our metabolism is at a medium rate, and it's constantly rising. So, you know, I could have put here medium and rising, because as we get more, as, as we keep going and do more things and lift things and sit at our desk and start talking on the phone and answering emails and are more active mentally and physically, then our metabolism continues to rise. And then for, at about 11 o'clock, 
our metabolism is at its highest point. And it will stay at its highest points maybe from 11 to 1, more or less. And that is when we're most aware, when we work best, when our body is in best form. So this is our natural process. This is what our body wants to naturally do. So I've done a little graph to help us see it visually, because a lot of us are visual. So this is a low metabolism. We're sleeping. And then we wake up, and it rises during 6 and 7 while we're waking up. And then it keeps rising until 11 o'clock, where it's at highest. And it's high for a little while, and then it dips down. And we get this low for a moment when our body wants to relax at midday. And then we have another rise. And we have a good amount of energy for a while, and then at the end it dips again. So this is the natural process of our body. If you see, we have two periods of a lot of energy. The first one being bigger than the second one. So in the first part of the day, we have a period of where we can produce a lot, whether we're going out and hunting for our food, or we're going to work, or we're trying to be creative and paint or write a song or play the piano, whatever. We have a lot of energy where we can accomplish a lot of things. And then later in the afternoon, we have another hill of energy where we can accomplish more things. It's not as intense as the first one, but it's, you know, it's about the same length of time. It's just not as high. And then we have that low period. So we could say that our day is divided into three areas. Area one, where we're most productive. Area two, where we're relatively productive. And area three, where we're sleeping. So, and if we, if we divide our day by this natural format, this is what we come up with. Eight hours of sleep, which is great. Who wouldn't love to have eight hours of sleep, <laughs> right? We have nine hours of productive work. Part of it is here, and part of it is here. We have one hour for our big meal, which is this dip right here. And then we have four hours of social time, which is this latter part here, with one small meal. And two hours for yourself, which is this decrease when we're relaxing at night, and this increase when we're waking up. And that's time that we just take for ourselves to get our body either ready for the day or to slow it down for night. And then I put in a small meal in the, our social time here and a small meal for breakfast here. So this is really what a good, metab good healthy metabolic cycle could be like. And you know, it's good. I mean, how many of us get a nine hours of productive work in every day? You know, I, for example, struggle in the afternoons with that sleepiness. So. How can we improve our metabolism so that we have this ideal, wonderfully functioning body that we should? So we need to understand that cycle and how we can best treat our bodies so that it works as best. The body's ability to digest and absorb food is best when our body is warmest. So when our metabolism is highest, and that is right here. So when should we eat food so that it absorbs the most amount of nutrition? At lunch. So when should our biggest meal be? Very, very clearly at lunch. Is that what our society teaches us? Not necessarily. Most people say skip breakfast, that way you'll lose weight. Get a lunch on the go because you've got to work. And then finally at dinner when you have time, then you sit down with your family and have a big dinner. That's not necessarily what's best for us. So eating a balanced meal with fiber, with protein, with vegetables, will raise the body temperature and therefore our metabolism. So the more we eat balanced meals, the better, stronger our metabolism is. Whereas drinking coffee, which gives us energy, 
or sodas or sweets, they don't positively affect our metabolism. Basically, you're just taking a syringe and you're injecting energy into your blood so that you can get by, but you're not really positively affecting your metabolism. You're not, you're not in a natural way giving your body more energy. Whereas if you eat a balanced meal, you are. When you eat, it is as important for your metabolism, when you eat, is as important for your metabolism as what you eat. And there's this study of the 2,000 calorie meal a day. So what they did was, they took two groups of people, and to one group they said, you're gonna eat 2,000 calories, for breakfast, and then the rest of the day you're not gonna eat anything. So they controlled very, very tightly what they ate and when they ate it. So they gave them one meal of 2,000 calories, which is what most people need for a day, for breakfast. And then the other group, they said, you're going to eat 2,000 calories in one meal at dinner time. And so again, they controlled very closely what they ate, when they ate it, so that they followed this. And what did they find? What they found was that the group that ate 2,000 calories for breakfast didn't change much. None of them went up in weight, none of them lost any weight. They pretty much continued the way they were. The people who ate 2,000 calories for dinner, all of them, every single subject in that group gained weight. That's very interesting. They're eating the same amount of calories. Why does it affect one group and not the other? Well, it's because when they chose to eat those calories. So sumo wrestlers, sumo wrestlers from Japan, they're really, really big, and they want to have a lot of weight. They know that it's, they know the secret. And that secret is if I eat a lot of food right before I go to bed, my body is naturally gonna turn it into fat. So if you want to gain weight, that's the secret to do it. Eat a big meal before dinner every night. Your body's just naturally going to turn it into fat. Why does your body do this? This is very interesting. Your body at night wants to clean the body that's its highest priority. So instead of eating and absorbing these nutrients and processing them in a natural way and sending it, the energy out in the blood and the nutrients to the different parts of the body, it's thinking, I have to clean the body, I have to clean the body, I have to clean the body. So what do I do with all of this nutrition that he's given me in this big meal before dinner? The fastest way I can get it out is to turn it into fat. So it just takes all of that nutrition, puts it into fat, and then gets busy cleaning the body. So that's how our body works. So we see that eating, we should see eating as a metabolic exercise and nutrient-rich foods as the weight that our bodies need to lift to stay fit. So when we eat a healthy, balanced meal at lunch, it's like going to the gym for our metabolism. And when we don't, when we eat coffee and a croissant and chocolate milk and soda and cookies, that's working against our metabolism. So we need to see eating healthy meals as like going to the gym for our metabolism. So if you want to have a fit metabolism, what should you do? One of the things you can do is eat healthy meals. And just like with exercise, you shouldn't do it when you're most tired. If you come home from work and you're exhausted and you think, now I've got to go to the gym, it's not as easy as when you're full of energy in the middle of the day and say, I'm going to take an hour break from work and I'm going to go to the gym because you've got lots of energy. Same thing with eating. If you eat when you have a lot of energy, when your metabolism is at best, you're doing your body good. If you're eating 
right before you sleep, when your met metabolism is low, you're not really working for your metabolism, but against it. So deep sleep shifts the bulk of our metabolic energy from running around and thinking and all of the things that our body does every day. It shifts all of that and it dedicates the energy to maintenance, to detoxification, to repair, and to growth of our bodies. So babies, when they're young and they're growing like crazy, they don't grow during the day. They grow at night or when they're sleeping. I mean, babies, when they're newborn, they sleep you know, 20 hours. So always when they're sleeping, their body is busy growing as well as maintaining and detoxifying the body. All bone and muscle growth happens during deep sleep. So if you work out at the gym and you see your muscles getting bigger, that's just a visual effect. It's not that your muscles are, ne are just growing as you're working out. Your body, your body is getting a signal that, okay, my body, my muscles need to be bigger. So then when you go to sleep, your body grows your muscles. But it happens during sleep. So our body has a very, very distinct set of things that it does at different times. This is the metabolic cycle. And the more we understand it, the more we can work with our bodies to, to do it better. The liver, which is in charge of taking all of the stuff out of our blood that's bad and getting rid of it, most of the work our liver does is also during deep sleep. So what happens if we don't sleep? Let's say that I'm 17 years old and I challenge some of my body buddies and we say, we're not gonna sleep for a week. We're gonna stay up all night and we're gonna party and we're gonna listen to rock music and dance. We're not gonna sleep. What happens to the body if we don't sleep for a week? Our bodies become so toxic because that process of detoxification doesn't happen. Our bodies become so, so toxic, and our brain is so, so full of toxins that we begin to see hallucinations. We actually start going crazy. And that's one of the first signals of not, not sleeping. So if you were to not sleep for five days, you would start going crazy. Why? Because your body is full of toxic chemicals. So sleep is very important in allowing that process. So what happens when we decide to eat late at night? Your body has to deal with that food. And so it spends the first four hours, digestion after a meal usually takes about four hours. If you eat a lot of meat, it takes longer. But in general, let's say four hours. So your body will use the first four hours of sleep to just get rid of this food, turn it into fat, and then it has four hours to do what it really should have had seven or eight hours to do. And so it's, it's falling behind in detoxification. What happens if you do that year after year after year after year after year? Well, that's where cancer comes from, for example. Cancer is a natural process in our bodies. We all have cancer cells right now as I stand here speaking to you, my body has cancer cells. But it doesn't need to be a dangerous thing for my body. If I am constantly detoxifying, if my body is finding these cancer cells and getting rid of them, then I can continue to be healthy. But if I don't sleep, and I don't allow my body to do this, or I eat late at night, and so my body is always behind in this detoxification, that starts building up. And eventually, these cells, there's enough of them, and they get together, and they start growing faster and faster and faster, and just the process becomes uncontrollable for my system. And that's when it's a problem. So to prevent it, we have to just be wise about letting our body sleep well, detoxify. We need good nutrition, so we should eat a big meal at lunch and let our bodies really take in all of this healthy nutrition shouldn't eat late at night and certainly not big meals. So we need to respect this process of metabolism. Research about sleep shows that we 
do not enter deep sleep if our body temperature is not dropping or low. So if you just ran a marathon and you try to lay down and go to sleep, you're not going to be able to. Your body is too hot. Your energy level is just too high. Your body needs to calm down, cool down for you to be able to fall asleep. So it's not physically possible to fall asleep if your metabolism is high. What do you do when you eat? You raise your metabolism. And so you're making it more difficult for your body to fall asleep. And then we've already talked about this. We should eat at least four hours before sleeping. So you should think in your mind, okay, I'm gonna, I usually go to bed at 10.30, say, or 11 o'clock. Everybody has a different schedule. Okay, 11 minus four hours. I should be eating at seven if I really want to optimize my body's health and this natural cycle of metabolism. If I want to give my body the best fighting chance to clean itself during the night, then I should sleep, uh, eat at seven o'clock or earlier. So in order to have the best health, we need to prioritize these two things to help our body in its natural metabolic cycle. We need to take in the most nutrition when our body is best suited to take it in. And when is that? In the middle of the day, when our metabolism is at its highest point. And we need to allow our body to detoxify and focus on repairing and growth when it is set to do that, and that is during deep, deep sleep at night. So these two factors are very, very important for our health and to understand in this process of metabolism. So how mood affects food? This is a very, very interesting subject. So I always talk about how we should eat healthier food and more fruits and vegetables and organic if you can afford it to get your hands on it and in season and local as much as possible. But if I were to get the best meal in the world, if everything here is local and organic and healthy and fresh and well prepared and I'm in a state of stress, I'm in a hurry and I gobble this down, it's a great meal but I'm in a hurry and then I leave, that meal which is full of wonderful nutrition, could basically be completely nutritionless for my body. Why? Because it goes right through. My body does not have the time or the peace or the interest to absorb any of that nutrition because I'm in a state of stress and hurry. So and this sounds a, <clears throat> a little bit like a myth but it's actually so, and we're gonna learn about this. This is very interesting. So there's something called the autonomic nervous system, which is ANS, and this controls the involuntary processes of the body. So like our heart beating, we don't control that. It's just naturally happening. Our breath, you know, we breathe in and out, whether we're thinking about it or not. Same thing with digestion. When I eat, I don't have to think okay, now saliva needs to come out, so now my stomach needs to contract the muscles, and that, all of that just happens naturally. So this is this nervous system, this automatic nervous system that we have. And this nervous system has two, basically two processes. One is called the parasympathetic, and one is called the sympathetic. So, and first I wanna just generally describe these two processes. The parasympathetic has a high internal process. There's a lot going on inside of the body. And a low external process. So I am not physically active, but my level of, of energy outside of the body, or activity outside of the body is low. Whereas the sympathetic is the opposite. So I am flexing and I'm running and I'm busy with the outside of my body, but the inside of my body is rather still. So it's because our body has its limits and it can't 
handle everything at the same time. So if I am physically active, if I'm you know shopping and lifting things and moving around and driving in my car, I've activated the sympathetic process in my nervous system. Whereas if I am sitting on a couch and I'm relaxed, then my body is probably taking care of processes inside to heal it, to clean it, and that's the parasympathetic process. So our nervous system controls these two processes. And then this is what the body does in order for these processes to work. So if it's doing internal work and what's the most important chemical component of all of this internal process, oxygen. So it increases oxygen intake. Why do you snore at night? Because your body is trying to take in as much oxygen as possible. Even if your nasal cavities are clogged up, your body is trying to suck in as much oxygen as possible. And even to even if it has to, it, it will snore to get in as much oxygen as possible. Uh, the body, the blood flow, and our body can control where the blood flows to. It prioritizes the midsection of the body where all of our major organs are, as well as the brain. A body nutrients are absorbed, so it increases nutrient absorption. Blood cholesterol decreases, cortisol decreases, and cortisol is a signal to the body to produce or to use up fat. So what are we doing at night if we haven't eaten a late dinner? We're actually youth burning up fat. And insulin levels become balanced. Also increase salivary secretion. So if we're eating when the parasympathetic system is going, then we have more saliva, increased kidney functions, and pleasure is increased. So, you know, something that you love, let's say eating chocolate, or flying a kite, or swimming in the ocean, if the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, and you do one of these things, you're gonna enjoy it more than if you're sympathetic process is activated. And then the sympathetic process is basically just the opposite. So it decreases oxygen intake. And this would, doesn't always make sense. Let's say that you see a lion come into this room. What does the nervous system do? It activates the sympathetic nervous process. And that means it decreases oxygen intake. That sounds illogical. I have to outrun this lion. Why would I take in less oxygen? Well, because my body needs to turn off everything it can, and there's actually oxygen stored in the muscles that it can use for running really, really fast. The process of taking in oxygens into the lung and having to go from the lung through the circulatory system to our muscles is too slow. And so our body just <clears throat> tightens up and boom, we can run really, really fast. The problem is it's only for a short period of time. When that oxygen in the muscles is gone, then the lion catches up to us. But it actually decreases oxygen intake. What happens when you get scared? Yeah. You stop breathing. Blood flow increases to the arms and legs. So instead of the digestive process and all of your organs having blood, it goes to the arms and legs so you can run or punch, or climb, or whatever you need to do, faster. Blood cholesterol increases, cortisol increases, insulin increases, and then you don't have salivary secretion, the kidneys also stop functioning, and pleasure is desensitized. And why does this happen? Well, if a lion comes into the room, and I have to run, and I see a chocolate bar on the floor, I don't want my body to think, mmm, yummy chocolate, no. Pleasure is desensitized. I don't care about that chocolate. I just need to get out the window as fast as I can. So it actually makes sense. This is what the body does naturally. 
in these two processes. So one could say that the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous processes are this on and off switch for nutritional absorption. When we are in the sympathetic, the run, the active, our body says, I don't need to digest. I don't have the time. I don't have the peace of mind, the energy. And so it cuts off absorption. So if you eat something when you are stressed, it's going through your body with very little absorption. <clears throat> Whereas if you have the system on and you're relaxed and you sit down to a nice meal and you smell the aromas and pleasure is increased and you take bites and you really, really savor these delicious flavors, your body is going to take in as much of that nutrition as it can. So that is that on and off switch. It's this automatic nervous system that controls it. So when we're relaxed, we take in nutrition. When we're stressed, we shut down nutrition. So there's this stress and mineral absorption study, and it was, um, they took two groups, and they had some mineral water with uh, sodium and chloride, and one group was relaxed. They put them on a sofa, they put some classical music, they said, the only thing you need to do is drink this bottle of water. Take your time, there's no stress. After you drink that bottle of water, then we're gonna do some exams, and that's it. And then the other group, they gave them the same bottle of water, but, they put them in a stressful situation. So there was no sofa to sit down on. He said, you gotta drink this bottle of water and drink it fast. You gotta have these headphones on and in the headphones there was one person talking on one headphone and another person talking on another headphone and so it was distracting and confusing, a little stressful. They chugged down the water thing and then they did the same thing with the two people. After they drank the water and waited for a while and they told them to pee and get the liquid in the cup, then they measured the amount of sodium and chloride that was in the water that came out. The people who drank it in the stressful situation absorbed zero. None of the chloride, none of sodium. The people who were in a relaxed situation, when they measured what came out, they had absorbed 80, 90% of the nutrition in that water. So it's, it's that clear So, who's ever heard of vitamin P? I'm going to teach you about vitamin P. P stands for pleasure. <laughs> so, we need to include in our food vitamin P. And that's nothing that you have to specifically look for in the food. That's something that you have to look for inside. When we eat, it needs to be pleasurable. Why? There's two interesting studies about how pleasure affects nutritional absorption. So they took two groups of people, a group of Swedish people who love um, salmon, they love fresh potatoes, they love dill. You know, the Swedish culture has a very specific type of food that they eat. And then they took people from Thailand who also have a very specific type of food that they eat. They like spicier food, they like rice and noodles, they like, you know, certain vegetables, lemongrass, coriander, all those kinds of good stuff, garlics, chili. And so they did a study where they would have the Swedish people eat a Swedish meal and the Thai people eat a Thai meal, and then they measured how much of the nutrition in that meal the body absorbed. And what they found was that the Swedish people absorbed quite a lot of nutrition from the Swedish meal, and the people from Thailand absorbed quite a lot of nutrition from the Thai meal, and then they switched them. And so they gave a Thai meal to the Swedish group, and a Swedish meal to the Thai group. 
And what they found was that when they were eating it, they weren't really enjoying it so much. Mm -hmm. Thai people had maybe never eaten raw salmon. <laughs> they thought it was a little weird. The texture was, and they thought these potatoes don't taste like anything. Where's the chili? Where's the garlic? <laughs> Same thing with the Thai people, uh, with the Swedish group. They were like, oh, this is really spicy. I need some water to get this down. And then they have, they measured the amount of nutrition that they absorbed from the meal, and it was significantly reduced. So, you know, we should eat things that we are accustomed to and that we enjoy, because the pleasure in the food and what we're accustomed to does affect how much food we absorb, how much nutrition we absorb from the food. The other interesting experiment they did was the experiment of the tasteless rats. So there's a specific section in our brain that is in charge of flavor and they went into these rats or they had two groups of rats and on one group of rats they took out that part of the brain that involves flavor so when these rats were eating their yummy cheese they were not tasting anything because that part of the brain was gone and then the other rats that still had that part of the brain they would eat their yummy cheese say this tastes really good. And what they found was that the rats that no longer had the sense of taste, even eating the same exact diet as the other rats, eventually died of starvation. Wow. And it's not that they weren't getting the food, but because they weren't tasting the food, and pleasure, this is where that's involved, because they weren't tasting the food, the brain wasn't sending the right signals to tell the digestive system that those nutrients were there and needed to be absorbed. Yeah. So even though they were eating the same meals as these other rats, because they couldn't taste them, they died of starvation. So mm -hmm. enjoying the food that we eat is not only about pleasure, but that pleasure is telling our system what it's taking in. So when I am eating a chocolate bar, and chocolate has some wonderful antioxidants, when I am enjoying that chocolate bar, my brain is sending signals to my digestive tract, saying, here comes some very healthy antioxidants. Make sure that you take these up. When I am eating delicious strawberries, fresh and in season now in Florida, and I'm enjoying every bite and just thinking, oh, this is so delicious, these aromas, it's amazing. My brain is sending signals to my stomach saying, here comes a lot of wonderful vitamin C. Make sure that you take it in. This is what the body needs. There is a chemical called cholecystokinin, CCK. <laughs> and when food makes us feel good, when we are enjoying our food, our body releases this chemical. And what does this chemical do? This chemical tells our body that it starts feeling satisfied and full. So if I eat and I'm not enjoying the food and I'm just scarfing it down, I'm skipping this natural process of enjoying my food releasing this chemical, CCK, and the chemical telling my body, I've had enough food. So when we eat in a hurry, we are likely to overeat. One of the reasons is we're hijacking our system. And we're skipping the natural process that should be involved in eating, which is pleasure. We should enjoy our food. That's telling our body a whole lot of things that our body needs to know with what to do with this stuff. So not only that, if you're having this meal in a hurry and you're drinking a soda, just jam-packed full of sugar, sugar suppresses leptin and leptin is a hormone which has the same function as this chemical CCK. It's supposed to tell your body that you feel full. So not only are we stressed and we're eating in a hurry, but we're chugging down sugar, 
we're double hijacking our system. And our system, of course, is never getting the signal that it's full. And that's why we overeat, because we're stressed, we're not enjoying our meals, we're not producing this CCK, and we're coating all of our meals in sugar, which suppresses the production of leptin, and so we never feel full. So that is why vitamin P is very important to having food. It's a natural, important part of the process of eating. So what is pre-hibernation metabolism? And this, when I read about this, I was blown away because this so clearly helps me understand the problem with the standard American diet. There's actually a very, very natural part of this process that we and that companies know very well and take advantage of and produce food that is specially designed to work with this process just to sell us more food. Not so that we're healthier, not so that we're eating better nutrition, they're just making more money. So the prehibernation metabolism works this way. When carbs and sugars are readily available, and when are they ready, readily available? In the summertime. That's when all the fruits are coming out, when you know potatoes are also growing, and all of this good sugar is being produced. Our bodies have a natural instinct to consume large quantities of that. So our bodies know that they can consume a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of sugars. And why does this happen? Because before there were supermarkets and refrigerators in everybody's house, during the summer months, you ate a lot. Why? Because in the winter months, you weren't going to be able to eat a lot. And so our bodies just naturally had this process. Now what happens when we eat a lot of sugar? Our body gets the signal, I don't need this right now, let's just turn it into fat and store it. So when you're eating carbohydrates and a lot of sugar, what does your body do? It naturally turns it into fat. And then you get fat and then November comes along, it's cold, fat is great against cold, it keeps you warm. It's a natural process that our body needs to survive. And then December comes, no food, January comes, no food, February comes, no food, March, Flowers begin to bloom, you can get a hold of some things, and then in April, you're back to your normal weight. So this is a natural process that our bodies developed to survive, and to survive these winter months. Not only do we gain a lot of fat to get us through this, the months, but it also increases cholesterol, which gives us heart disease. Why would the body want to have a lot of cholesterol? It also increases the retention of water and salt, which gives us high blood pressure. Why would the body want to increase its blood pressure? It seems unnatural. Not only that, we're eating a lot of sugars, so this insulin is out of control. Our bodies become insulin resistant, which is basically diabetes. So all of these unhealthy processes naturally happen in the body. But what happens is when there's little food available, all of these unhealthy processes just naturally settle down. And in April, we're back to normal. So these are just processes that the body has to cope with this lots of food and then no food. And it just happens naturally. What happens now is that we live in a society where it's always summertime. There's always lots of sweets and lots of carbs. There's no time when you can't walk into McDonald's and get french fries. And so there's never that time of winter when all of this gets regulated. I had a lecture on fasting. That's why fasting is so good for us, because it allows that winter time for our bodies to just naturally regulate all of these abuses that we put it through. So fortunately, now we don't have these summertime and time of famine. We have food available 
to us always, but that's not necessarily so healthy for us, and we need to understand that. So, and then finally, this idea of calorie counting, it's very in incomplete. We need to understand that, and it's even faulty. It doesn't tell us the whole story. A calorie is not a calorie, and that's what the food industry has been saying for a long time. A calorie is a calorie. It doesn't matter if you drink 2,000 calories of Coke, that's gonna be great, that's good for you. As long as you need, don't have one more calorie, you think, no, but this carrot, no, no, you already had your 2,000 calories of pork, Coke, that carrot's gonna be terrible for you. <laughs> no, a calorie is not a calorie. 2,000 calories of Coke, or chocolate bars, or sweets, is not the same as 2,000 calories of well-balanced meals with brown rice, and vegetables, and protein, and the little desserts as well. So this idea that a calorie is a calorie, the 2,000 calories is all we need to be healthy, is incomplete and faulty. In India, there's this concept called prana. And prana is basically life energy. And when they think about food, they don't think about food as just something to enjoy and to consume and party. Of course, they have that as, as well. You know, food is something to celebrate together or be social. They see food as a source of energy. And so when they sit down to eat, they think, I need to eat as much as I need to so that I have, so that I'm full of energy again. Not so that I'm full in my stomach and feel satisfied and heavy. No, they wanna just get as much energy as they can so that they can keep on doing the things they need to do that day. And I really like this concept of prana. So it's taught that you should walk away from a meal with more prana than when you sat down to eat. And that's an interesting concept. Next time you sit down to eat, eat a little bit slower, and throughout the meal, maybe after you've eaten a third of your meal, think, where's my energy level now? How do I feel now? Does my body feel better or worse than when I sat down? I was hungry and now I'm less hungry. Is this enough? Eat some more and then think, oh, how's my energy level now? How does it feel now? Did I eat enough? Am I still hungry? Am I enjoying this? Is this good? Should I finish this? And then eat the rest of it and think, how's my energy level now? And you feel, ooh, I'm really heavy. I overate. I should have maybe stopped at that second point because I felt satisfied. I felt like, oh, this was a good meal but there was still a little bit left over. Well, maybe next time I'll just wrap that up and save it for dinner tonight. So it's interesting, this idea of, of prana. So don't eat until you feel full. Eat until you are full of energy, because that's really why we are eating. So find your prana. I encourage you to do that. So if food that you're eating does not deliver pleasure, then it probably is indicating that the quality of food that you're eating is too low. A carrot should be delicious to eat, should be full of flavors. A strawberry should be delicious to eat. If you bite into an apple and it's tasteless, it's probably not a nutritious apple. And this ties back to what we talked about last time. How to improve our metabolism and thus our health through excellent nutrition. So what are the things that we talked about in these two lessons? Vitamin O, oxygen. The number one thing we need, our body needs. Water, quality food. So it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Vitamin T, which is this time. So when you eat, don't be stressed because you're activating this sympathetic part of your nervous system. You're not taking in uh, nutrition. Vitamin P, pleasure, and then this idea of prana. And then this is just a thought that I wanna leave with you. It's time to learn from the lean and healthy experts that still eat traditional quality diets. This happens in Latin America, it happens in regions of Asia, and South Pacific, and Africa. 
it's we, the Western society, that has distorted this concept of traditional quality food. So let's let's learn from them because they're lean, they're healthy. There are places in this globe where none of the population gets cancer. That's amazing. So we need to go back and learn from what they're doing. It's time to graduate from this idea of calorie counting to a healthier and happier form of eating. Live, eat, believe in yourself. Find the natural intelligence within you, and that means pleasure, it means listening to your body and what it needs. Find the natural intelligence within you that guides instinctive and effortless appetites. This idea of fighting hunger and I've got to starve myself, I've got to starve myself, I've got to starve myself so that I lose weight, that's wrong. If you're hungry all the time, it's probably because you're eating food that has no nutrition. And what does our body need? Food that has nutrition. And when it does get that, then it'll stop feeling hungry. Trust it, respect it, honor the beautiful nourishment process that lives within us. Let go of fear and learn to listen to your body. And understanding this process of metabolism and how it works in its natural form can help us to help our bodies to have healthy metabolisms, absorb good nutrition, detoxify, just generally be 